Well, as you can probably tell, this is not a Sunday morning, and I'm saying that because of the way I'm dressed. In fact, this is a Thursday morning, and uh, I'm doing this again because our live stream failed this past Sunday, and we wanted to make sure to uh, get the sermon from Sunday online and on our channel so that we can have the whole series through Genesis. So with all of that said, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me in them to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to continue what we started last week, and that is studying the book of Genesis, studying the beginning in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. In the beginning of the Bible, in the Bible's account of the beginning, we learn about foundational things like the universe and us. But before those, which we're going to get to, we are taught about God. And specifically, that's what we're going to continue today, studying what the beginning teaches us about God. Last Sunday, we found three facts about God in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, which again says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The three facts that we talked about from verse 1 are, number one, that God is real. He exists. There is a God. Number two, God is eternal. In the beginning, God already was. He was before the beginning. He always had been, and he always will be, even after the end. He refers to himself in Scripture as the God who was and the God who is and the God who is to come. And then the third fact that we talked about from Genesis 1-1 is that God is creator, creator of everything. That's what the phrase the heavens and the earth means in Genesis 1-1. As the creator, he is ruler, meaning that he makes the rules and in creation, he reveals this along with other of his attributes. Because of creation, the Bible says that people are without excuse for not believing in God. This morning, we're going to find and study two more facts about God. The first of which is also in Genesis 1-1. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Fact number four is that God is singular, meaning there is a single God. There is one God. In the beginning, God singular, not God's plural, created the heavens and the earth. And this was significant. Uh, this is significant. I want you to remember that this was written by Moses for Israel, God's people, after God had delivered Israel from their slavery in Egypt and before he brought them to Canaan, the promised land. And the religions of both Egypt from which they had come and Canaan to which they were going were polytheistic, meaning that they believed in plural or many gods. Many, many gods who were over many, many different things, over different areas of life and the world. In Genesis, and the next four books of the Bible, which Moses also wrote, God, among other things, was distinguishing himself from the gods of Israel's pagan neighbors, like those that they had in Egypt and those that they would have in Canaan. God was distinguishing Israel's religion, true religion, from false religion. And one distinction is that he was singular. One God there was. He was not one of many gods. There was one God. There is one God their God, that is Israel's God, our God, the God of Scripture. 
And he is over everything. He's not merely over one thing or one area. He's not merely over some things. He's over everything because he created everything. The singularity of God is the point of the first of the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 20 verses 2 and 3 it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me or besides me. And the reason that God in the first commandment taught them and us that they were to have no other gods before him or besides him is that there are no other gods, no other true gods. There is just one God, a single God, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, the God of Christianity, this God of creation that we're reading and studying about. This was, and it still is, a foundational teaching, a foundational part of the education and training of the Jews from their childhood. Look with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and I'll read there from verses 1 through 9. It says, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gate. And these things that they were to teach their children and their children's children were to begin with this truth. The Lord, our God, the Lord is one. The foundation of all that they were to be taught and all that they were to teach as the people of God was the singularity of God, which is taught here and taught in our passage today in Genesis 1-1, and taught throughout Scripture. Consider just a couple of chapters before, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 35. It says, To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides Him. This is quoted as well in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 60. In Deuteronomy 4.39, it says, Know therefore today and lay it to your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. There is no other. First Chronicles 17.20 says, There is none like you, O Lord, and there is no God beside you. Psalm 86.10 says, You alone are God. This is taught throughout the book of Isaiah, and I'll give you several examples from that prophetic book or the book of the prophet, beginning with Isaiah 44, verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. 
Verse 8 in that same chapter, Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. Then Isaiah 45 verse 5 says, I am the Lord and there is no other besides me. There is no God. Verse 18 of that same chapter, for thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is God, the creator, he is God, the one that we're studying about in Genesis 1, who formed the earth and made it, he established it. He did not create it empty, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other Isaiah 46 verse 9 says, For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. In John chapter 1 verse 18, he is referred to as the only God, something that we see as well in 1 Timothy 1 17. John 17 3, he's referred to as the only true God. Romans 3.30, which we also see in Galatians 3.20, says God is one. 1 Corinthians 8.4 says there is no God but one. 1 Corinthians 8.6 says there is one God from whom are all things and for whom we exist. 1 Timothy 2.5 says there is one God. James 2.19 says you believe that God is one you do well. In the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 3, God singular, as I mentioned last week, is mentioned 35 times, whereas God's plural are mentioned zero times. God's in the scripture always refers to what is false to what is not true, to what is not real. So the fourth fact from the beginning is that God is singular. And that brings us then to fact number five, and it will take up most of our time together this morning. And that fifth fact is that God is plural. Now, by saying that, I haven't just contradicted myself. I didn't say that there are plural gods, but that God, the singular God, the one and only God, is plural. Meaning that there is a plurality within the singularity of God. He is singular and plural. And by plural... I mean that the one God is more than one person. He is three persons, to be exact, a doctrine that we call the Trinity, which we sing about in the hymn, Holy, 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 when we say, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. And that captures for us, in a nutshell, the meaning of the Trinity. The Trinity simply means that we believe in one God who is three persons, and each of the three persons is equally God, and each of the three persons is eternally God. And the three persons are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Or we could say the three persons are the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Now, search all you want, and you won't find the word Trinity in Genesis chapter 1 or Genesis chapter 2. Or for that matter, you won't find the word Trinity anywhere in the Bible. And while the words Father and Son are found throughout the Bible, we don't find them here. In Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. But the Trinity is clearly taught in Scripture. And we do find the beginning of that teaching in this passage about the beginning. 
What we find here in Genesis 1-1 and Genesis chapters 1 and chapter 2 is not a full-blown teaching of the Trinity. The rest of the Bible builds on what we find here and expands on what is hinted at here. The revelation of this doctrine of the Trinity continues as the Bible continues and it especially continues in the New Testament. And in light of that teaching, the teaching of the rest of the Bible, particularly the teaching of the New Testament, we then can see the doctrine of the Trinity here in the beginning of the Bible, here in this account of the beginning in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. And in this account of the beginning, we will see the Father and the Son and the Spirit. In chapter 1, verse 1, we see God in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Now look at verse 2 there in Genesis 1 with me. It says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So in verse 1, we saw God. And here in verse 2, we see the Spirit of God. Who is God too? He's called the Spirit of God, but at the same time, certainly appears to be distinct from God in verse 1, making the God that we encounter in verse 1, God the Father. So what we learned about God last week in verse 1 is true of God the Father. God the Father is real. God the Father is eternal. God the Father is creator. In Malachi chapter 2 verse 10, it says, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? 1 Corinthians 8 6 says, There is one God, the Father, from whom are all things. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 6 says, There is one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Isaiah 64, 8, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. As a father, you see, God make us. Like a father, God made us. He made his children, people, his children. He made all people. Now, some people, he's made twice. So you see, God is a father in two senses. We could say that God is a father to all people in the sense that he has created all people, but the vast majority of times in Scripture when it refers to God as Father, it's not referring to Him in that general sense, but in the second sense that God is a Father, He is in particular and especially a Father to His children, His people, those who are trusting on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. So then we could also say that people are Children of God in two senses. All people are children of God in the sense that God has made everyone and he is fatherly toward them and they are responsible to him as a father. But only some people, only those who are trusting on Jesus for salvation are the true children of God. The sense in which the Bible refers to the children of God most often. And that's what I mean when I say that God has made all people, but he's made some people twice. He made us, and then for Christians, he has remade us in Jesus. As a father, God provides for us, which is what all fathers should do for their children. God provides for his children physically and spiritually. He provides for his children. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. 
1 Peter 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, Jesus spoke about God's fatherly attitude and God's fatherly provision for all people. He said there that God makes the sun shine on both the just and the unjust, that is, the believer and the unbeliever, and that he sends his rain on both the just and the unjust. Jesus also said in Matthew 7, 11, if sinful earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to and provide for their children, which most do, even many lost fathers know to do this, which all fathers should know to do this. If sinful earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to and provide for their children, how much more does God? Well, much more. And the reason that even lost, unbelieving fathers, many of them know to do this, because it comes naturally and instinctively having been made in the image of God. As a father, God is steady and stable. He's reliable and dependable and faithful. And He is present as all fathers should be. As my father has been, as Cheryl's father has been, as many of your fathers have been or are, and as many of you are, and I applaud you for that. I can't think of a societal problem, and there are many problems in society. I can't think of a societal problem that isn't somehow connected to fathers either contributed to or caused by bad fathers or that would be significantly reformed by good fathers. Yet, even the best of fathers, like my own, even the best of fathers, earthly fathers, are imperfect. Far, in fact, from perfect. But God, I want you to understand, is a perfect father. So as a father, he loves. But as a perfect father, he loves perfectly. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what kind of love the Father has given us. That we should be called the children of God. And so we are. God is a perfectly merciful and compassionate Father. Psalm 103, 13, As a father shows compassion to his children, which fathers should. So the Lord shows compassion to those who fear Him. 2 Corinthians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. As a father, God also disciplines. And He does this not from His wrath or His anger, but from His perfect love for His children. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves or disciplines him whom he loves as a father the son in whom he delights. This is the point in that well-known passage, Hebrews 12, which speaks about fathers and discipline and doing so because they love and goes on to make the point that if we are not disciplined by God then it means we are not the children of God one more thing about God as father he saves he saves 
He saves the day like my father did so many times. You could say the same, many of you, about your father. He protects and he preserves. That's part of what I mean by he saves as a father. He protects as fathers should and many have. He preserves as fathers should and many have. I mean when I say at least in part that God saves that as a father, he's a hero. A hero that all children need. A hero that all children look instinctively for in their fathers. And one that, bless the Lord, by God's grace, I I found all, all children have heroes for me and maybe for many. I didn't have to look outside my home for a hero. He always lived in the same place I did. And I'm thankful for that. But he was merely a reflection of our Heavenly Father who as a perfect father, even far better than my own, saves. He is the hero that we need, not just to save us from some situation we're in today, but to save us eternally from a situation of our own doing for the most part. The situation of sin. Zephaniah 3.17 says about God, He is mighty to save. 1 John 4.14 says, We have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. And Jesus said in John 10.28 and 29, I give them, that is my people, eternal life, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So, God, in Genesis 1-1, is the Father. And that means that the Spirit of God, in verse 2, is the Holy Spirit. And all the facts that we learned about God last week from verse 1, all the facts that we just said are then true about the Father, are true of the Spirit too. Because the Spirit is God, too. Meaning that the Holy Spirit is real. He exists. Baptist, the Holy Spirit is real. He exists. He is mentioned here. And He's mentioned throughout the rest of the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament. Meaning that the Holy Spirit is eternal. The Holy Spirit, you see, presented here was at the beginning. He was before the beginning. The Holy Spirit was not part of all that God created. For the Holy Spirit as God is the creator, was involved in creation. Job 33, 4 says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath The wind, those are synonyms with spirit, breath and wind. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. We see this connection in the next chapter of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. It says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath or the wind or the spirit of life. And the man became a living creature or a living soul, a living spirit. In Psalm 33, 6, it says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath or the wind or the spirit of his mouth, all their host. Psalm 104, 30 says, When you send forth your spirit, they are created. So you see, it's not just that God gives life. God the Spirit gives life. Both physical life and spiritual life. Both temporal life and eternal life. This is what Jesus was talking about in John 6, 63. When he said, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. We sing this great truth in one of my favorite hymns which says, all is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Zechariah 4, 6 makes this point in saying, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, 
says the Lord of hosts. And so when it comes to our great need as a community or as a church or as a country or all of the great needs in our world, we need to be reminded that our might, our power, our wisdom is unable to fix even one of the problems. It is unable to cure or to meet even one of the needs. But the only thing that is sufficient is the Spirit of God. And He is indeed sufficient. And so we should call out to Him, this One who gives life and has done so from the very beginning. You see, going back to what verse 2 said, it's not just that the Holy Spirit gives life as any gives it today. The Holy Spirit gave life. He's not just... It's not just that He is a Creator. He was Creator. Verse 2 said He was hovering over the face of the waters, over the face or the surface of the deep waters. Waters which hovered over the face of the earth. And it's describing here, generally speaking, the earth initially as God first made the matter or the material from which He would make the earth, the world as we know it. And it's described, this initial matter and material is described, the initial earth is described as being without form and void, which means empty. And it's described as being dark. And the words that are used there are used elsewhere in the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, And they always describe a place that's like a desert or like a wilderness. They always describe a place that is uninhabitable. And it was that way initially. Until the Holy Spirit's work in creation, until the breath of God, until the wind of God blew and moved. And that's why the Holy Spirit in verse 2 is described as hovering over this initial matter. Something that is the word hovering is a word that we understand better from where it's used elsewhere in the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 10 and 11. It's talking about God and His relationship with Israel, His people. It says, He, God, found Him, Israel, in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness. He, God, encircled Him, Israel. He, God, cared for Him, Israel. He, God, kept Him, Israel, as the apple of His eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. You see, that usage in Deuteronomy 32 helps us understand what Genesis 1-2 is describing when it says the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the earth. The Holy Spirit, you see, was like a mother bird over its helpless chicks. And in this case, the helpless chicks was the formless, empty, dark earth covered by deep waters, the uninhabitable earth. The Holy Spirit then warmed and formed. He guided and changed. He gave life and He filled. He was the creative force of God bringing order into that disorder. Something that's referred to in a passage I read during my prayer time last Sunday, Psalm 104, verse 30. The Holy Spirit was active in the creation days, which we will study in weeks to come. He was active in days one through three of creation when, check this out, the earth was formed. You see, verse 2 says, initially it was formless. Well, then we move from the general to the specific in this account of creation. And it recounts for us the forming of the formless earth. And the Holy Spirit was involved in this. 
working on days one through three, bringing form and shape to the world such as we know today. That word formed and shaped will be used as we have already seen in chapter 2 verse 7 about how God took the clay or the dust and formed or shaped man. And then the Holy Spirit was active in the creation of days 4 through 6. Check this out. When the earth was filled. Again, go back to verse 2 in your mind or even with your eyes. Verse 2 that says that the Holy Spirit was hovering over the face of the surface of the earth and the earth was formless and empty. And so then, again, in moving from the general account of creation to the specific account of how it became what we know, on days one through three, God formed the formless earth. And on days four through six, the empty earth was filled. And this was a part of the work of the Holy Spirit of God. God the Spirit continues to work in just this way in our lives. Because you see, in our sin, in our lost condition, we are dark, are we not? We are formless. We are empty. We are in deep water. We are out of order. But the Holy Spirit in salvation brings light to our darkness, life to our death, fullness to our being empty, form to our formlessness, order to our being out of order. The Holy Spirit in salvation rescues us from the depth of the sea in the same way that God rescued Jonah. The Holy Spirit then helps and comforts, and counsels, and teaches, and guides us. He fills us. He encircles us. He cares for us. He keeps us. He stirs us up. He flutters or hovers over us, and He covers us with His wings. He then catches us and bears us on His pinions. The Holy Spirit unites us. He brings us together in order as the church, the people of God. And like the Holy Spirit did with the initial earth, He empowers or brings out of us the things that we were created and recreated to do. Things like Jesus talked about in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 when He said, you'll receive power. When my Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And more broadly speaking, the Holy Spirit brings out of us what we were created and recreated to do. And that is ultimately to glorify the Lord, our creator, and in Christ, our recreator. So now that we've seen God the Father in verse 1 and God the Spirit in verse 2, that leaves us with one person left in the Godhead. One is missing in our discussion, for two does not a trinity make. Who are we missing? Well, you know, it's God the Son. We're missing Jesus. And so the question might be, we've seen God the Father, we've seen God the Spirit. I see, you might say, God the Father. I see God the Spirit clearly in verse 2. But where is Jesus in the beginning? I don't see him. Where was Jesus in the beginning? And that's what we'll cover in next Sunday's message beginning in verse 3. For there, we will see Jesus. And after that verse, in many verses, we will see Jesus. Now, without seeing Jesus specifically this morning, uh, we are going to see Jesus. What we have seen, even without covering Him, 
as we've covered the Father and the Spirit, is that this God, this God of creation, is worthy, deserving, is owed our worship. And so I would ask you, are you worshiping Him? Are you worshiping Him? And where we see Christ, even before we see Him in the text, is that Christ is the only way to worship this God. The only way that we come to God, the only way that we can be saved is through The Lord Jesus Christ, through God the Son, through turning from our sins and trusting on Him. Trusting on Him as Lord and Savior. Trusting in His perfect life and His sacrificial death and His victorious resurrection. Trusting in Him for forgiveness of our sins and for righteousness or being right with God and for eternal life. So I ask you, have you turned from your sin and trusted on Jesus to save you? Are you, at this very moment, turning from your sins and trusting on Jesus for salvation? I would also ask you, have you publicly professed Him? Maybe you have and maybe you are turning from your sins and trusting on Christ, but you have yet to publicly profess Him through being baptized. Why not? There is no reason that you should not, other than some physical limitation, for failing to be baptized when you trust on Christ and are physically able to do so amounts to publicly denying Christ. I would also ask this morning, are you serving Christ in a local church, a faithful member of His body? And then I would ask, are you living for Him? Serving Him by serving others. Loving Him by loving others. Following Him in obedience. And even in our disobedience, in continued repentance and faith in Him. I'd love to talk with you about any of these things. Please come and see me. Bow with me now as we pray. Our Father, I thank You for what we've continued to see about you this morning, about your Spirit, and for what we're going to see about your Son. We praise you because you are real. We praise you, Father, because you are eternal. We praise you and worship you because you are Creator, our Creator, and in many cases, our Recreator. We praise you for your singularity this morning. And we praise and worship you for your plurality as well. And in all of it, I pray that our thoughts of you would only increase and that we would be blown away by how incredible and how awesome and how in some ways how mysterious you are knowable to us because you've made yourself known but incomprehensible in terms of our being able to understand you completely we worship you as a god who is higher than we and we praise and worship you in your holiness and i pray that you would work in our lives to bring us to understanding you better and to living for you more. And especially I pray for those that have never repented and believed on Jesus, that they would, I ask it in his name. Amen.